You know, everybody talked about the slave trade and how black people got to the Americas. But I want to take us back to a period that nobody wants to talk about. In the period around 1324 or thereabouts, the world got introduced to a personality called Mansa Musa. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you for checking me out. My name is Eko Simpson. I'm a Ghanaian. Um, and I live in Ghana. Well, you are watching this channel because somebody introduced you to it. It was recommended or suggested to you on YouTube. Basically, my YouTube channel is to connect Africans and the motherland to Africans in the diaspora. So, thank you for checking me out. If this is your first time of watching my videos, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel. Mansa Musa was from the West African Kingdom that we know as Mali. Many of our people here today are descendants from those kingdoms. Ghana, Mali, Shanghai. We all migrate. So he was famous because today they call him with all your Warren Buffett's and your Bill Gates and your Zuckerman. They say that Mansa Musa, by every standard, was the richest man that ever lived. That he took 60,000 men from West Africa all the way to Mecca. I want you to get this picture. Mansa Musa took 60,000 men from West Africa to Mecca, passing through Egypt. And he had more gold than anybody had ever seen in the world on him. He was richer than anybody could ever imagine. And all the time that he was on his travels, everywhere he went, he spread that gold around. He spread that gold around. And when he went into Mecca, they say he broke the stock market, brought all the currencies down because he had so much gold and was spending it so freely. He did the same thing in Egypt. But he was from West Africa. They say that he had 12,000 men that were called servants. All they did was serve all the other members of that entourage. Out of that 12,500 of those men, they were dressed in apparel that they said was weaved and sewn that was more beautiful than they'd seen anywhere in the East, whether it was Persia, Egypt, Iraq, any of those areas. That's how they were adorned. And 500 of those men out of the 12,000 servants, they said they walked with golden staffs. Not wood painted with gold paint. But golden staffs that weighed no less than seven pounds each. 500, they walked in single file. Like you see, our not no walking today. So when they came back from that pilgrimage, they talked about the glory of Mansa Musa for centuries. But you know what? No one ever talks about how Mansa Musa became king. Mansa Musa became king because his uncle abdicated the throne. And how did his uncle abdicate the throne? His uncle heard about the continents across the Atlantic. And he wanted to find out if there was land across the Atlantic. This is 180 years before Columbus, the first white man, across that Atlantic. I'm talking about our history. They stole our memory. And they lied to us. I want to tell us some of the truth. Abubakar II was the uncle of Mansa Musa. And he took, he sent 200 shiploads of men and 200 shiploads of gold and provisions across the Atlantic to find out if there was land there. And he wasn't satisfied with that. A year later, he mounted up 200 more ships of gold and provisions and goods. And then he himself joined that second expedition of 200 ships of men and sailed to the Americas. So when people got there, they saw Native Americans looking like you and I already there when the white man got there. Our ancestors have been traveling to the Americas before any white man knew there was an America. They didn't know that there was a North America. They didn't know that there was a Central America. They didn't know that there was a South America. In fact, that first white man, Christopher Columbus, thought he was going to India. 
He didn't know he was going to bump into a new continent. That's why they called him Indians, because he discovered what no man in Europe knew, that there was other continents. So rather than tell the truth that he found a new place, he went back and lied to the king, Ferdinand, and to the queen, Isabella, and told them that he had landed in India. And he renamed the people Indians. That's why they're called Indians today, because he lied and said that he went to India. And even some of our people, when they were carried away from here, we even call ourselves that, West Indians. That's how mixed up we got. I'm saying that to say, at that time, Europe was coming out of a play. They were at war with each other. Their standard of living was very low. Most of them were poor. Only the royalty had money. But the citizens were peasants. They had no money. But they also heard about this rich king and his source of gold being in West Africa. So you had Arab traders and you had Europeans who were speculating about where did that gold come from? We want to find that source. Because there's a people living in West Africa whose standard of living is higher than any standard that we ever knew. They even also knew that there were people in West Africa that knew how to sail across that Atlantic. I'm telling you the speculation that brought the white man here to start about trouble. We got to know why he was coming. Because today, we think that the white man is automatically means money. The O'Brony is the money. We think Europe is money. We think America is money. But do we understand how that money was acquired? How Europe got rich and we in Africa got poor? Do we ever question that? How is it now that 500 years later, the people who were sick and poor are now sick and rich? Yes, they're still sick. And we, the people who were rich and healthy, are now poor and healthy. We still got the best bodies, the best spirit, the best limbs, but we're in poverty. Why? Because of that mind that I said earlier that was stolen. How can we be walking on the richest continent in the world and every historical record, contemporary historical record say we're the poorest people in the world? How? How can we have the largest gold deposits anywhere in the world and we not be rich? How can we discover oil and bauxite and minerals every month we read the newspaper that we have found another precious mineral? And we got to ask white people to come in here and help explore that precious mineral to give us some jobs. The people that our ancestors worked during independence to be free from, now our political leaders, the first thing they do is get dressed up, go to Europe, meet with the leadership, and say, please, Mr. White Man, can you come and open the factory so my son and my nephew can have a job? Please, Mr. White Man, can you come and show us how to get the gold out of our ground and refine it? Please, Mr. White Man, my people ain't got no job. Now, we got an undeveloped nation. We got to build houses. We got to build railroads. We got to build industry. We got to build homes. And we say we're jobless. How can we be jobless with all this work to be done? Unless our mind is not conditioned to be industrious. And if our minds are not conditioned to be industrious, who reprogrammed our mind? The speech that Atunfo said in the beginning, we could have stopped everything then because he said it in a sum total. I'm adding footnotes to it. To give some footnotes to his overview that was very much on point. Consultation of our enemies. But if we learn to put value on ourselves and trust in each other, we can rebuild Mother Africa starting with rebuilding our minds. You know, in the New Testament, in the New Testament of the Bible, Yeshua, whom men called Jesus, was sent to try to solve the broken people. I say broken because our people were under the Roman Empire. And he's trying to give them a message of freedom. Well, ultimately, they crucified him, as we all know the story, but they didn't want to hear that. 
But one of the messages he tried to get through to the people is that you all cannot have the kingdom restored. They weren't talking about building a nation. They weren't talking about building a state. They were talking about the kingdom. That's how you get that term kingdom come. They thought the King David was coming back. He was going on the throne. They were talking about building a kingdom. But he told them that you cannot even see the kingdom in your mind unless you are born again. And some profound professor, university professor, said to him, but Master, what do you mean? How can I be born again? You mean I got to go get back up in my mother's womb? He said, but you were supposed to be a man of letters. I thought you went to school. And you asking me a question like that? He said, I'm talking about renewing your mind, freeing your mind from Roman occupation, from foreign occupation from foreign dominance, from foreign values, and come back to the understanding and the knowledge of who you are, knowing yourself and believing in yourself. That is what being born again is. You can't have no fake born again and you're still the same person. We can't be born again and be looking like white people, acting like white people, dressing like white people, wanting to be white people. This is not racism. This is black love. This is racial love. No other people are made to apologize for being themselves. So why do we, as African people, have to apologize to other people anytime we talk about loving ourselves and being ourselves? We have a right to be in love with ourselves. We have a right to romance ourselves. We have a right to promote ourselves. And most of all, we have a right to be ourselves. The whole world wants to be like us. But if we don't forget who we are, you see, when the Congressional Black Caucus came here during the year of return, and they had the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, when they went back and got met with all this white racism and the protests that was going on, here it is that this Nancy Pelosi, not even of African descent, I don't think, you know, white folks got more about blood in them than they want to acknowledge. But she suggested, why don't we put on that kente that we got in Ghana? Wanted to be like us. Some of us were saying, look at them, they got on kente. What are they doing? You got white people wearing kente. Were well, you wearing their clothes? You carrying their spirit on you? So what's wrong with them putting on our spirit? So our ancestors can speak to them. We haven't shed their wardrobe. So if they got something they admire about us, let's promote that, not to be deceived. So I say to us, we have to go back to school and allow our minds to be reshaped and refashioned out of the mold that they have been fashioned in. And that is not hard to do. That is the essence of what this university, Obergesi University of Excellence, had been established to do. We have, during the time of what they call Reconstruction, there was about 10 years that we had in the U.S. after slavery ended, that they looked like they were going to try to restore part of our dignity and give us a chance that they had robbed from us during all the period of slavery. So they call that the period of Reconstruction. It only lasted for 10 years. But during that period of Reconstruction, we had established over 37 universities, black colleges. They call them HCBUs now, Historical Black Universities and Colleges, or Colleges and Universities. 37, straight up out of slavery. The idea was that we got to train a new generation of Africans not to think like slaves, not to think like they're enslaved, not to think like they're less than. Because you can't take somebody who was born in slavery, told all his life he's inferior, who doesn't like himself, and now say you're free. We realized we needed universities and schools to teach us how to be free. But those institutions weren't able to live out their course. There's many 34 out of 37 still exist, but they've been compromised. They're still responsible for training the largest number of professionals that you see in the United States of America. They still do a good work. But the work is not finished. The work was supposed to also relink us back to Mother Africa. Our universities here, 
Our universities here in Ghana and all over Africa were established that we can raise up a generation of Africans that can manage our own affairs. We got the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And yet, we buy all our cell phones from somebody else. We buy all our cars from somebody else. We buy all the gadgets and mechanisms that we want to use every day for somebody else. Now all the world is producing these cell phones. They can't produce a single cell phone without the minerals and the valuable parts coming from Africa. Not one cell phone can be produced without what Africa has in some material. Not one. Not one color TV. Not one satellite can be sent in the heavens so that you can get a signal to radar. Those satellites need gold. See, we wear gold around our neck and on our ankles and on our brain and on our arm. But the white man needs that gold for his world of technology. Every computer has gold in it, has silver in it, has copper in it. Every satellite has gold in it, has silver in it, has copper in it. Every cell phone has the same thing. It can't function in impure material. It needs pure materials in order to function, and those pure materials come out of Africa. So what's wrong? That in 50 years, our own University of Science and Technology cannot produce the technology that we are consuming as Africans. Africa is buying more cell phones than anybody in the world. That's not speculation, that's fact. Do the homework. But we're not making it. We're assembling parts from other people. But we're not making it ourselves. Those are our jobs. That's our economy. That's our lifestyle going up. That's our young people not risking their lives across the Mediterranean or across the Atlantic, killing themselves to try to get out of Africa, but they don't see no opportunity. We got vaccines coming in here that we didn't produce as gifts. As gifts from the people who helped put us in this position. We're our scientists. We were the best herbalists in the world. We gave the concept of medicine to the world. The Greeks that came to study in Africa called Egypt, they didn't come and study in no Arab Egypt. They came and studied in African Egypt. So when they got their so-called degrees, which were very small degrees, we only gave them a license to go back and practice medicine. We had the masters of medicine. Our healers knew how to heal someone, keeping their parts in their body, not cutting out the illness, not cutting out the sickness, and say that you're healed. That's not healing, but you didn't go to the root cause. That's why they got licensed to practice medicine. They got licensed to practice law because they never mastered medicine. They never mastered law. But we don't know we gave them those degrees. We gave them the cloth, the cloth that we're wearing in here. Our elders are wearing in here. Where do you take the concept of the cloth that the judge wears? Where's the concept of the cloth that the pastor wears in church? Where's the concept of the cloth that the graduate wears when he's graduating? It's not a robe, it's called the cloth. That's why they called the minister a man of the cloth. That's the cloth that came from our ancestors because we were masters of the cloth and we know how to wrap the cloth. That's our culture. They made the robe out of the cloth. And that's why every man of degree has to put on the cloth. So when you walk across the stage, you put on cloth. To walk across the stage, they just call it a robe. You can't stand up in a church and preach the gospel without putting on a cloth because you're supposed to be the man of the cloth. They never mastered the wrap of the cloth. So they had to make a ready-made sewed cloth and call it a robe. We gave them those degrees and sent them back up into Europe to try to civilize their own people. And because they stole our memory, we forgot who we were. So we believed the false teachings that yes, we're like happy the white man came here. Because the white man had come here, how could we learn how to sew clothes? How could we learn how to build a house? How can we learn how to have a, a, a government building? How can we learn how to govern ourselves? Well, that's why we're so messed up and misgoverned and unclothed and out of our mind. Because we're not following our systems of governance for our development. If we put the white man out and he left his institutions here, have we gotten rid of him? How did colonialism begin in the Gold Coast? It began with us accepting the British law as our rule. We accepted the British law to rule us 
And then that ruler stretched from 12 inches and left from being a ruler to a yard, and from a yard to being a mile, and from a mile to being our whole territory. That's right. They started out convincing us that let us govern you by our British laws. And look now where it has gotten us. Now we have ourselves in hot West Africa, our judicial service wearing wigs and wearing robes, and sweating in the, sweating in the court with somebody else's cloth on rather than the cloth of their ancestors. That's right. If we don't get this mind fixed, we ain't going to fix it. We got to get our minds fixed in order to fix it. People don't like that, but we cannot find ourselves wanting to be experts in British culture and remain African at the same time. It cannot happen. We have to set the standard, which only means let's go back and retrieve it. Sankofa, it's already there. Let's capture that standard and bring it back. We ain't got to go back to the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. We only going back and get that egg and bring it into the 21st century. We're the ones that bring about most of the discoveries that brought the West into their modern day status. What many of us here attribute to Western civilization is what we Africans brought from here to there. We gave them their light bulb. They had a spark, but it took an African genius to get a filament to make that spark turn into a light. Now they give credit to Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was a thief. Now read about it. One of our ancestors, Louis Latimer, took him to court, and he got he was found guilty twice for stealing his ideas. So I'm not just some angry black man calling white people names. I said he was found guilty of stealing technology from one of our scientists. That's how we got a light bulb. That's how we got the refrigerator. That's how we got the shoemaking machine. We now saw a movie some years back of the black women who were human computers before you had a computer. And they calculated how the white men who went to the moon, how they can land back on Earth. Black women, African women of African descent, they calculated. That's not the white man's genius. They stole our genius from Africa. They didn't steal us because we were strong as bulls. They stole us because we were intelligent and we were spiritual. The first English white men that landed in Jamestown, Virginia. Do you know what happened to them? They all starved to death. Almost all of them. Those who didn't starve to death. They lived because they turned to cannibalism. They ate their own colleagues who died. That's the first expedition to Jamestown, Virginia. See, we talked about 1619, the 2019, the 400 years, but they didn't tell you what happened before 1619. But the first Englishmen that landed in Jamestown, Virginia, almost all of them died. And the four to five of them that lived, lived on the flesh of those that died. So they dug up dead meat and ate their own people. And the second expedition of English people that came in and found them, did a survey and said every one of those that survived were out of their mind. They were mad. See, they teach us that we're cannibals. We come from jungles. So they hide that history. And even we, when we hear, we don't even want to believe. We love the white man so much, we don't even believe the white man, the white man we love. Not my good white man. He can't be accountable. But these are the people. I mentioned the state of where we were in the 14th century and where they were in the 14th century before they came in contact with us to know that if we don't know where we were, if our reference is that we're coming up out of the bush and we're coming up out of the jungle, that that was our state and so it was good that the white man came in contact with us. So now at least we are living a better life. If we don't know what we had in our glory and our brilliance, we won't know what we have the capacity to achieve ourselves if we focus on ourselves. That's my point. We need to be able to hire higher standards than our former oppressors. There's a proverb in the scripture, I say that because many of us, we study scripture, even though we are African selves. There's a proverb that says, envy not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. 
Now, where does that leave us? If there's a proverb that says, envy not your oppressor and choose none of his ways, then what are we doing? We've chosen almost all the ways of our oppressor, and we envy him. That's why we choose his ways. We have conversations, I hear on radio, arguing about our state in Ghana, which is worth arguing about, but not comparing with England, not comparing with America. You can't argue our destiny comparing ourselves with them, because are we prepared to do the wretched things they did to be where they are? Can we go and steal a whole land from somebody and take all the riches of that land to catch up and be like America? Can we go and enslave people all around the world and take their riches to catch up and be like England? We can't do it. And yet, they find themselves in economic hardship. Here America had 257 years of free labor from our ancestors. Free labor. They had land that belonged to somebody else with gold and timber and everything in it. They stole it. And right now, today, America's broke. America is in, I can't even count the trillions of dollars of debt that she's in. With all of that free money and free labor, England used to own Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt, the Gambia, Jamaica, the Falkland Islands. England owned all of that, and yet today England got poor people on the streets. So how can we copy them and be successful? when they are not successful. So we have to chart our own course. We cannot rely on their benevolence and think that that's our future. So, as I said, the band was assigned to Ginger Meetup. And this first session is assigned to Ginger You Up. I'm not going to give you everything in the first session, but the time is limited. I only had about 40 minutes of ginger to give out. 